Hi everyone, welcome to the 17th episode of Conceptualism. Today I have with me Sam Wilson, who is a guitarist, a band leader, composer, uh, and uh, you've been doing some really interesting projects. Um, and uh, thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you. Um, so I want to start by asking a cliched question, which is uh, about your gear. I want to know about your guitar, um, you know, your, your Gibson uh, hollow body or semi hollow body, because it's a beautiful guitar. Yeah, it's a, it's a Gibson ES339. Uh -huh. And I bought it in 2010 in Michigan at the guitar center there. Okay. Um, yeah, it's, it was like, just like lightly used, like it, it wasn't made too, too long after I bought it uh -huh. or before I bought it. Okay. Um, and then I bought a Fender Deluxe, um, from the same place uh -huh. and it's, it was a used amp and it's bright orange with black stripes on it, which I didn't customize, but it was already customized that way. Uh-huh. Uh, and people always think that's kind of cool, but yeah, pretty simple set setup. Um, I, yeah, just a clean tone. Um, I've dabbled in pedals here and there, but it hasn't really become a big part of my world yet. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's totally fair. I mean, you, you do so much with the clean tone anyway, like, um, like your use of harmonics is really quite beautiful. Um, you know, and, uh, like it kind of it kind of reminds me of of the the kind of playing that like Lenny Bro used to do, um you know, um with all those like um uh, like pinched harmonics like on the strings and stuff like that, um yeah it's 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 quite beautiful and it's also minimalist like your your playing is definitely um you know like like in that like in that style I mean mm -hmm. like I would say like all the notes that you play like really matter because the you don't like I don't know. There's there's not a lot of extra. It's like what what needs to be there is there, and I really love that about your playing. Thanks. Yeah. So the Lenny Bro has come up a lot lately. I feel like I should get back into listening to him because his name just keeps coming to me. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> so, Sorry, cut you off. <clears throat> no, no, no worries. Um, I was gonna ask you who your influences are. Like, who, who, who did? Who do you listen to? Like, what, what kind of, uh, like, wh where, where does your sound or where, where do your ideas come from? Um, <clears throat> I've been asked that a lot, and I find it a hard question to answer because I'm listening to new stuff all the time. Right. Um, with, like, the exception of, like, the odd album that I'll just kind of, like, loop. Mm -hmm. um, I would say, like, as of like yeah it just depends do you mean like lately or like sure yeah let's 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 say lately like l lately what's been in your ears like what have you been listening to um i've been trying to listen to like some local canadian musicians so last fall i went to the bamp center for the arts and i met a bunch of really talented artists so i've been listening to them um anna b savage from the uk who's like a amazing singer songwriter uh tambor i might be mispronouncing it that because he's french from montreal he's like a minimalist contemporary piano okay player. um justin wright who plays cello and it's again it's instrumental music mm -hmm. and, then, and then my friend uh jessica ackerley she plays like avant-garde free um, guitar, jazz stuff. Nice. So I've been listening to her because it's out of my normal, like, what I normally listen to. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to challenge that a bit. And then I've just been listening to, like, um, like, I would say classic, like, Nora Jones's new album, uh, some old stuff like Towns Van Zant and um, Etta Baker and Elizabeth Cotton, who are like old folk guitar players. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, just a really diverse mix. Yeah. I haven't been listening to much jazz lately, actually. 
which is interesting. <laughs> yeah. And um, I think uh, speaking of avant-garde and, and like experimental music, um, I think you also went to Jerry Grinelli's uh, creative music workshop. Yeah, I did. Um, that would have been two, no, 2019. Okay. Summer, summer, yeah, before the one before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that was, and you did too, right? I did, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Did. yeah. That was, uh, yeah, that was a remarkable experience. I mean, it was, you know, um, it was really interesting because you had all these different skill levels and all these different, you know, artists who, you know, who had such a like plethora of influences and like and ideas coming to the table and you know you had to work with them and these were people you may not necessarily have chosen to work with on your own terms but because you were at the workshop it was like you were put together with them and you had to had to make it work and uh yeah it was really interesting because i i took my tabla to the creative music workshop and i had no mic on them so so like you know and all the other all the other instruments are sort of always overpowering my my instrument so like so yeah, it was kind it was kind of interesting to like have that limitation of you know playing an acoustic instrument that was quite you know that was quiet because um, yeah I, I, yeah it was interesting um, and then I got really frustrated that nobody was listening to me so eventually I was like you know what I brought my keyboard in and then and then you know and then I and then of course I could like compete with the rest of them yeah yeah I. Um... I really enjoyed that workshop. It was super uncomfortable. <laughs> and usually that's when like you kind of grow a bit. Yeah. Something shifts. I agree. Yeah. yeah. Being uncomfortable is, is like, uh, it, it's such an important part of the artistic process. Cause like that, you're right. That's when the growing happens. That's when, you know, you, you start asking the difficult questions and yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And you're also a teacher, right? Like you're you're also um, you're also teaching guitar now. Um, that you're doing this workshop for uh, women and non-binary folks. Um, and uh, yeah, that's that's an amazing initiative. Um, yeah, I have like um, a private studio that I just started in the fall online. Resonance Guitar School. Yeah, and then in addition to that, this uh, free group is like kind of a. I wanted to have a component where it was accessible for people here. Yes. I'm, I'm in a rural community now and I used to live in the city. Yeah. So, um, yeah, there's not as much like, or from what I could find as many options as there are in the city. Right. So I just wanted to provide another option. Um, yeah, I'm really enjoying the teaching. I, I learn as much, like when I'm teaching, I usually learn something too. Yes. Just by witnessing someone else's process of learning. Yeah. Um, yeah, and it keeps you refreshed on all your fundamentals, which is good. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Do you um, teach at all? I do. Yeah. Yeah. I I have taught. Um, yeah. Actually, one of the one of the courses that I taught uh, at university was um, uh, how to listen, bearing witness to the human condition. Uh, and 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 it was interesting because, um, you know, I, I I had prepared no notes and I and I had no like no PowerPoint, so you know I just went in there and and like improvised and it was like it was probably one of the hardest things I ever did because like I had to, you know, like I had to I had to like keep everybody's attention at the same time like I had to stay relevant and on topic and and you know but but I wanted to challenge myself to you know to do a class where I had no you know like obviously I prepared I knew about the subject I, I was passionate about it but like I didn't I didn't like I didn't do a powerpoint or take notes or do any of those you know things that normally you do when you you know when you teach a university class yeah so yeah I love teaching too and speaking of you know learning styles like what kind of learner would you say you are like are you a visual learner a kinesthetic learner um I would say partly both Okay. I have a very, very short attention span when it comes to learning. Okay. Um, so I have to like do a bunch of things throughout the day okay. and learn over like a span of time really slowly. Um, I remember when I was like 
music aside, if I were learning another subject um, in school, the best way to learn was to just read and try to like memorize the page. And then when I went into the exam, I would just try to imagine the paragraph mm. and then <laughs> try to like piece together what I had read. So not really like photographic, but like kind of vi like visual. Like I would try to like imagine where I was when I read that and imagine the, what the page looked like. And then sometimes I could find my answer. <laughs> yeah. So I would say the bare minimum to learn the thing is my learning style. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know if that's good or not but hey whatever yeah. whatever works for you I mean whatever you know whatever floats your boat I think I, yeah like that's the thing right like everybody has these um different learning styles and the different ways of learning and I think if it works for you then that's that's the proof you know is it effective yeah. does it work for you if it works for you then great you know um how do you learn I guess um I'm an oral learner. Like I, I, I learn by listening. Uh, yeah. So, so, um, you know, and I also learn by doing so like by actually experimenting. And so I, I would say like, yeah, same. The, the, the way that I like class myself in terms of learning styles is like as an autodidact. So a self learner. So, you know, if somebody's sitting there lecturing me for an hour, I'm probably not going to learn as effectively as if I do something for five or 10 minutes. Do you know what I mean? Right. So, yeah. So like, like even when I'm teaching, like I don't, I don't lecture. I, I try to, I try to do it more in the style of like, you know, a Socratic seminar where, you know, there's a, there's a particular, you know, idea or a topic. And then, you know, everybody, everybody has a chance to talk and go back and forth and have a dialogue. Um, Cause I think, um, I think like participation is really important in learning, especially for me and for my, the way that I learn. So I try to, I try to make that like a key part of my teaching experience is that like, I want people to participate and I want people to like be involved in the process of learning and actually like, you know, do something that'll like help yeah. them learn. And, and yeah, like, like you, you know, I also do the bare minimum to, to learn what I need to learn. So it's, I, there's a similarity there because <laughs> I'm also very lazy, you know? So. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to say that word, but I was like, lazy learner. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it, I'd, yeah it's kind of like the path of ease and flow like yeah just like yeah with a little bit of challenge and um but yeah I, I get what you're saying like when I when I teach I try to like say the thing and then get them to apply it so that they're taking that information and then doing it yeah in a, in a way that's like in a context in real life yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, speaking about the path of least resistance, you know, I think as artists, sometimes we also have to take the path of most resistance. So like, True. like, <laughs> you know, cause like, yeah, like getting your music heard or like getting a gig or I don't know, like, like, you know, like even like when, when, you know, you're doing an interview with the media, you know, like there's, you know, there, I feel like sometimes that's the path of most resistance because it takes a lot of effort and a lot of, you know, a lot of courage even to, to like, to say, you know what, what I'm saying matters and, you know, listen to me. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. I've definitely had those too. I don't mean it's all been <laughs> like that, but yeah. And do you, have you found it hard to be an artist in Toronto? Yes. Yeah, it, yeah. Is, it is hard. Um, and I'm, and I'm very glad that like I launched my career in, in Nova Scotia. Um, because you know, if I'd done, if I'd done it in, in Toronto, I don't, I don't think I would have gotten, I would have gotten as much recognition as quickly. Not that that's why I was doing it, but like it would have been much harder to get established. So, you know, the fact that I'd already done all this work in Nova Scotia and also in Montreal before I came to Toronto, I think that really helped like, like, cause people took me seriously. Whereas if yeah. I come to Toronto and I had no experience in Canada or whatever, then, you know, and I, and I'd wanted to start out in, in Toronto, I think it would have been much, much harder. Yeah. So yeah, to answer your question, it is, it, I guess there's a lot more happening in Toronto. So, so it's like, you know, 
So if you do, if you do, if you like, let's say you want to do a concert, then you know, uh, there's also twenty other events happening around the city that same night. So yeah, you know, so it's much harder to compete. Whereas in in Nova Scotia or in Halifax, you know, if you're doing an event, maybe there's like another event or two other events happening the same night. You know, so it's yeah. yeah. There's a much smaller population, but you're right about there's less comp like to choose from. Mm -hmm. compared to the bigger city yes yeah yeah so what have, what have been your favorite places to perform in acoustic wise like what kind of acoustics do you like to work in um i like i like rooms that aren't too reverb uh where there's not too much reverb yes but where there's not where you like send it out and it never comes back like some somewhere in the middle okay um, if that makes sense definitely i don't know how to say that in like a proper uh, you said it i i got it don't worry about it yeah yeah, yeah. Um, so i'm and, guessing i'm guessing then like like playing in a church or playing like say in a you know or or playing like, like in one guess, of those spaces would be less appealing to you because of the amount of reverb it depends on the context, I guess. I should have said that first. It's like if I'm playing solo, then it's okay. But if it's like with a band, then I pre don't prefer that setting. Mm -hmm. um, but I played in a chapel in Woolfield solo, and that was really good because it was like just my guitar and it was big enough. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, it kind of filled it all out. Uh, in terms of like venues here, I haven't played, I've kind of played the same places, like, but I recently played at the music room in Halifax and that was really, that was good. Uh -huh. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. Nice. And yeah, I like 1313 Hollis, but I, I don't know if that's because of the space or just, or the acoustics or just because of the space, like, hmm. um, and I've played their soul and with the band at both times. It was good. Yeah. Yeah. It helps when there's like an audience. So that kind of helps with the sound. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I, I played a show at uh, 1313 Hollis with uh, Jordy Halley um, and a couple of other cats. And um, it was, uh, yeah, we had one person show up to that show. <laughs> 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 And you know, I was telling Jordy, you know, we should have we should have recorded the thing because like we did some really interesting stuff, but you know nobody was nobody thought you know what let's put up a recording device and like capture this. So so that that show is like only in our memories and of the one person that showed up to that show. Yeah. Do you remember who came to the show? Uh, yeah. Um, it was a a guy called Hank. Um. Hank Hammer, I think is his name. And uh, he was from the States. He was working as an animator. Uh, he also played guitar. Oh, his enthusiasm just like filled the room, made it feel like like it was a packed audience. Because he was like, every, every time like something cool would happen, he would like, you know, jump up and like say, yeah, and like all this kind of stuff. And I don't know, it was, it was, it was hilarious. Because like, you know, um, like I, I've never, I'd never played a show for one person. So it was, it was like, yeah. it was like an experience that I think was worth having, you know? Yeah. Oh, another space that just came to mind was the art bar. Have you ever played there? No, no, I haven't, I haven't played there. I like that spot. Yeah, even though it's small. Yeah, it had a cool, intimate feel. Definitely. <laughs> and um, have you ever played at Obladi, that, that uh, wine bar? No, I haven't, actually. Yeah. yeah. Not yet. Yeah, that, yeah, I mean, acoustic, it's a very small space, right? But, but I would yeah. say but I would say like the acoustics in there are, are like decent. The problem is people tend to talk over the music and because there's a lot of reflective surfaces, like uh, that ta people talking, it, it tends to bounce off the walls and then suddenly, you know, it's, it's much harder to listen to the music. Um, it's, yeah. it's not a, it's not in that sense. It's not like a, a traditional jazz bar in that like people don't keep quiet and respect the, you know, the music and listen to the music. People, yeah. people come there to drink and talk and the music is kind of like the, you know the music it's the stuff in the background that nobody's really listening to yeah which which to me was very annoying because i went there to listen to the music you know yeah 
that can happen. Yeah. So like, like, like <laughs> speaking about audiences and like, you know, the, 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 you know, the kind of feel of the audience, like, um, like, have you, have you ever like struggled where like an audience wasn't listening or like the audience was maybe talking over the, the music or whatever, or have you, have you like generally had a good audience where they, you know, they're respectful, they, they listen to what you're doing? Um, well, it depends. Like I've played gigs where I'm presenting music and they're buying a ticket to come listen mm -hmm. and they, they, they're, it's always great. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I play gigs where it's intention is to be background yeah. Yeah. um whether that's like at a restaurant or like for a party or you know those like kind of more corporate situations mm -hmm. um and in those situations no one's actively listening but usually afterwards someone will come up and be like oh i really liked that i know no one was uh looked like they're listening but we could feel it or like the someone always ends up coming up to me and with a comment and then I'm like, Oh, okay. Yeah. It did add to the experience. Um, but I went into it knowing that no, I wasn't the center of the situation. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. As long, you just have to know what you're going into. Definitely. Yeah. And then not get like too sensitive when it's really loud. <laughs> you're just being buried yeah well what about I, you i i played um i played jazz piano at a hotel and that, that was a gig of mine um uh, in tanzania and uh and i was told one time there, were, there, were, there was i think two business people like sitting in the background uh have trying to have a conversation and so one of them came up to me and basically told me to shut up in the middle of my play oh. <laughs> That's horrible. Yeah, I've been asked to turn down before, and I'm like, oh, why am I doing this? <laughs> yeah, yeah. They, they didn't. They didn't even say like play quieter. They were just like, shut up. We don't want to. We don't want to listen to the music. So you know, my response to them, and I wasn't being impolite. I said, you know what? If you don't want to, you know, don't want to listen to the piano, then uh, you should go to uh, some other space. The hotel has loads of other spaces. Like this is the. I mean, I've been paid to play here, you know, and I'm doing my job and I'm doing what I'm doing. So you know, I'm sorry, but I can't stop and. Uh, and so, yeah, it, it became a thing and, you know, and, and then management was called and it was like, it was, you know, it was a little bit of a kerfuffle, but, but I, I wasn't, I wasn't just going to shut up. Like, I, I, I didn't think that, I didn't think that that was appropriate. I mean, if they told me to play quieter, I would have like taken that into account and I would have played quieter, but like, but they were just like, shut up. And I was like, I'm not doing that, you know? <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> yeah, Business one, I run the world. <laughs> Got, got to stand yeah. up to the man, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I usually stand up quietly, unseenly. <laughs> yeah. The least confrontational. <laughs> In my own ways. Yeah. yeah well, How, when was the last time you were back to Tanzania? Uh, the last time I was back was about, like, two years ago um um but i'm excited because I'm, I'm actually going to be going um in december uh, okay i'm i'm actually traveling back um, yeah i'm pretty excited about that because i'm gonna i'm gonna do my first pipe organ concert in tanzania this time so that should be cool. interesting. yeah you know um so have you um like so y you've played with uh, like ensembles and bands and stuff and like, what generally is the instrumentation that you're comfortable with? Like, do you, do you like the trio format? Do you like the quartet format? Do you like larger ensembles? What's your, like, what's, what's your, where, where are you comfortable? Uh, I would say I'm comfortable when it's rehearsed, um, <laughs> which isn't always an option. Um, <laughs> I like playing with, uh, I like playing duo with uh, my friend, Andrew Jackson. Yeah because we've played together a lot. Yes. Um, and duo is always challenging, but uh, yeah, I like playing and I like playing solo and I like playing, I like playing duo with a bass player too. Mm -hmm. um, and I like playing with a quartet when, yeah, like I said, when we've had a minute to mesh a little bit. 
Yeah. So like drums, bass, and then a horn player, and then me. Yeah. Um, I've never played with a piano player, so I would like to, but it just hasn't happened. Uh, yeah, and there hasn't been because there's a lot of like small spaces around here. You're, you kind of that duo or trio is the option, and then if you want the bigger on like a quartet or bigger it has to be for like uh the jazz fest or yeah um a, something that you're someone else is programming right like the upstream or um yeah those those spaces for those groups are limited mm -hmm. uh wait actually i have played at the art bar i take it back i have played at the art bar i played with uh with uh, Nick Dorado and uh, Andrew McKelvey, I think, uh, and and Gordy yeah. was there too, and so was Lucas Pierce, and yeah, it was it was a uh, was kind of yeah, it's really the interesting. Jazz Fest? No, no, I think this was like a this was an event that they organized. It could have been part of the Jazz Fest, but I don't think it was. I think it was like an independent event that they organized, um, and yeah. it was like it was free improvised music, uh, you know, like um, it was it was really interesting actually. Um, yeah, so I have played at the art bar. Yeah. <laughs> I just I just totally forgot about it. But yeah, I've played there. Cool. And have you played at the at the Kyber or like or that uh, th that space? No, I haven't played there yet. Yeah. I'd like to, but yeah. Yeah. So your music was Oh wait, I have. You have played there you go. <laughs> uh, I I'm still like waking up a little bit. <laughs> coffee um no i played there with uh andre fenton who's an amazing poet and author yeah um i was kind of accompanying his poetry um for a jazz fest show in may like a couple of years ago when they do the intermittent free ones yeah leading up to the festival yeah um, so yeah i have <laughs> played there yeah it was cool yeah small audience but so good yeah yeah and sorry what were you gonna say oh, i was just gonna say that your your music's been picked up by this uh japanese label um, yeah yeah that's 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 really cool congratulations thanks so um, how'd that come about uh it came about so when i it's kind of like a tale uh when i released groundless apprehensions I was working with the syrup factory to help promote it. Um, and Sarah uh, from the syrup factory sent my music to her friend Vince, who is a publisher in Toronto. Um, Cause he was like, what should I listen to? And she sent him this and he was like, became a fan, I would say. And he signed me <laughs> onto his small publishing company, Simba Music. Yeah. And then, he has connections in Japan and um, what, it came about through his relationships. So initially they like listened to Groundless Apprehensions, but then through that they found my EP Into a Heart, which is just, was a very like rough solo, um, low budget recording. Like I think I spent a hundred bucks on that recording. <laughs> um, <laughs> which is not even possible now unless you're doing it yourself and then they were more interested in that and said could you re re like send us that and add some tracks to make it a full album so I had actually lost the masters so I had to re-record all of it <laughs> <laughs> and then I wrote four new songs and then interpreted three jazz standards because that's they wanted like three standards i guess um and i was happy to put that together um and did that to in throughout the first part of the pandemic so was like working on it in may and april which was i found really difficult i don't know how you found that time but um it was hard to be motivated uh <laughs> despite having a deadline. And then it did get done because of the deadline and then recorded it in June, 
released it in September. The, the mixing and mastering part took a, a while because I was living on the North Mountain in the Valley and the internet there is really bad. So every time John had to like send me something to listen to, I had to drive to the library, which was like a 17 minute drive. So it was just so slow, that process. Um, but sometimes I want to get his message and... I, I have a feeling because of that, there, there was a certain part of the process which actually made it like, do you, do you know all these little things, these idiosyncratic things that sort of like driving to the library every time you need to listen to something? I have a feeling like it added something to the, you know, to the sound or to the, the feel of it. I, and I don't know how, like, I don't know how, but I have a feeling like somehow it, it made its way into the, into the sound. I, I yeah. I don't know. Just like having to do that. Towards the end, I was like, can, I, can we just finish this? <laughs> like, <clears throat> but <clears throat> yeah, it was a, it's an interesting story. It's like something I'll never forget because it was just a weird time and weird circumstance. And I was living off, basically off grid. Like I had cold water and lights and every time I needed to make a tea or do the dishes, I had to boil some water. Um, you know, Would you, no plumbing, no bathroom. Okay. Um, so, so then if you wanted to take a shower, then you'd have to boil water, I'm guessing. Oh, the shower, there was like a sh outdoor shower on the land. Okay. So I just, she, I, it was like a propane, um, right. shower, but it was outside, like in the forest. It was really cool. It was, yeah. That sounds, that sounds so amazing. That sounds it was like a pretty magical cool. spot. Yeah. Yeah. And like gardens and. I just spent a lot of time outside, which was really healing. So lucky to do that. And yeah, it was very minimal. Like, so maybe that's how that morphed into it. Um, yeah. And I, because of the, <clears throat> no, like, <clears throat> excuse me, um, slow internet and stuff. I was only listening to music that I had on my computer that I had purchased. Right. Um, so I was listening to less and I was listening more to the environment and to the birds because there's like tons of birds around there. It was really, or like walking to the ocean and listening to the, to the ocean or, so I was listening to more of what was like around me in real time opposed to, um, recordings. That's really cool. That's really cool. Well, and, yeah. you know, the ocean is kind of like nature's, uh, nature's most remarkable aleatoric you know, installation. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Um, and like, it was a rocky beach. So like the water would come down and be like, Shh, you know, that sounds like. Yeah. Yeah. And the wind, like the wind around there was, cause it was on the um, North Mountain. Like there's some wind. Yeah. I could go on about it, but. <laughs> Please do actually. Please do go on about it. I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated. Like, yeah. I just, what kind of birds? Down and before. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, you go ahead. And then I'll ask the question. Um, and prior to that, I had traveled to New Zealand and I found the same thing there. So I was living um, in rural New Zealand. Uh, like, I worked at a retreat center. And um, when I was there, again, the internet, I didn't really have, like, if I wanted to use the internet, I had to walk to the main house and like, it was just a thing. And I just found that listening to the, um, there, there were so many birds and there was so many birds that I'd never heard before. And like, I, I didn't feel the need to go listen to, to music after just listening to what was around me. Um, if that makes sense. Totally. Yeah. Cause I was just connected. Like I was connected to where I was. And sometimes I think when I'm going to listen to music, I'm looking for that, some connection. Like, it's not just like a dopamine hit. It's like, I'm looking to feel connected to something bigger. For sure. And that was like fulfilled where I was. Um, and then when I came back, I like, was that, a friend's house for the first bit of, because it was kind of still winter in March 
in Nova Scotia anyways. And uh, I listened to a ton of music because I was inside. And then I went and moved again and was living outside again. And it, it kind of was listening less. Now winter's coming and I'm listening again to more. So it's just funny how that's going like that. I don't know. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, yeah. You said you said that you're trying to connect with something bigger, you know, or something deeper. Um, so, so I guess uh, I want to ask about your your spiritual practice or like what what kind of like, yeah, like like you know, do you meditate? Do you um, yeah? What what's your spiritual practice? I I do meditate. I found the last like um, I would say like October November I fell off the practice and was not vibrating at my best frequency um and now i'm kind of like getting my like pushing myself to pick that practice up again i also part of that practice is like for me it's reading like i'll pick up books on different religions or philosophies and i find the reading part um part of my spiritual practice because i'm learning another perspective or point of view on how people see that part of life. Um, and, and more and more improvising is becoming part of my, like I'm realizing that music is like, that's the way that I want to like bring it all together. Um, and that's beautiful. Yeah. That's beautiful. I'm not like any specific Real, like mm -hmm. devote to any specific religion but I respect all of them and like see how they all have their um, place definitely yeah yeah I, I I feel the same way that I don't really you know I don't really belong or identify with any one particular religion I mean I was raised in a Muslim household but like I would I would say my own spirituality is much more eclectic you know like I I'm in, yeah. I'm interested you know in Zen I'm interested in um, you know Zoroastrianism and you know many many of the other religions that that are uh, that are available to like because I think I think they, they all sort of you know they're all a particular path and and like they all they all have their own sort of ideas and so like 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 you I, I think I just respect all the religions but at the same time I don't feel the need to identify or belong to any one yeah yeah I was raised Catholic, <laughs> so I, I, yeah, it's that like strict, um, I don't want to say strict religion, but like, sure. Well, I mean, it just didn't resonate like the, all the, the way it, I felt confined by it, like, which some people don't, which is great. They, helps them but yeah yeah well i mean you know um i think like i think i think where religion you know gives you the rules and tells you you know how to behave and you know sets down all these guidelines spirituality is so, sort of the you know the antithesis spirituality is like the free thinkers uh you know yeah i mean spirituality is more the, the the it gives you the liberty to question everything to you know to have your own journey and to do what you want whereas religion is very prescriptive it tells you this is what you yeah. have to do this is what you don't have to do and and you know it stigmatizes certain things so i i think i i would choose spirituality over religion any day you know just personally yeah yeah same personally yeah you know, you were telling me. Were... Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. <laughs> oh, just saying that all of that part of life really fascinates me. Yeah. What were you going to say? I was going to say, you know, you were talking about listening to all these birds and, you know, and having like such a, there was such a deep oral environment that, you know, you suddenly like, 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 like you didn't even need to listen to music because like there was music everywhere. Um, well, you know, um, Messiaen, the the French uh, organ composer, um, he he was obsessed with birds. He was actually an ornithologist, um, and uh, 
he one of the pieces was like that that he wrote was basically 17 different kinds of bird song combined together cool um, and so like do you do you also like draw like specific references from nature like do do you have you know do you have a particular piece that's i don't know inspired by the wind or the ocean or rain or birds or i don't know like do you have these these kinds of references in in your music like so i haven't done it like consciously hmm. um but i there i had an idea for a project where that's like next year i hope to do that like to do it more consciously hmm. I think definitely it's been subconsciously or like subliminally gone into my music. Like, um, like one song off of, uh, groundless apprehensions, Riverside waves. Mm. Like I wrote that. And then afterwards it made me think of the Detroit river, which is, um, I grew up in Windsor, Ontario. Yeah. And, and I was like, Oh, of course that's what that song's about. But I didn't know until like after, yeah. Um, but you can like I imagine the guitar part is like the water and then um <clears throat> the horns are kinda like you know, like the people in the water or like maybe there's a storm happening or some <laughs> so I imagine this like scene in my mind um when I hear that song. Yeah. But I didn't sit down and I was like, I'm gonna write this with water in mind. Um <clears throat> yeah yeah that's really cool um yeah like there are so many things happening in the subconscious which then translate into our music and then and then when we look back we're like yeah so that's what that was about yeah and like uh um on one of the tunes off of my this new newer album it's called railway spine there's like this uh call and response part with myself nice. and that was definitely inspired by like the birds because <laughs> I would hear like this bird calling and then this one responding and then another kind of bird and it was just this like that's beautiful yeah. net like yeah that's so in that way yeah that's beautiful that's that's amazing um well and, and you know actually speaking of antiphonal you know call and response type stuff um, you know, it kind of made me think like, it would be so cool if like, you know, you were plugged into, I don't know, like five or six different amps and they were put all in all different spaces, like in a, in like a really grand acoustic. And then, you know, you were like, uh, you had like a pedal board where you could switch where the sound was coming from and you could do like call and response with yourself. Like that would be, that would be so cool. That would be cool. <laughs> you know, uh, sounds very technological. I'd have to get some help. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, that'd be cool. <clears throat> well, and I think you can even do that like digitally, like like uh, like in post production, where you can sort of yeah, like, you can pan you can pan it so like when you hear it, like it's coming from different places, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So like you know, I I just recently recorded a free jazz album with a guitar player, a drummer, and then me on keyboards, um, and and it was really interesting because like you said, you haven't worked with a keyboard player before or a pianist. Um, yeah. so it, you know, obviously like the guitar and the piano, you know, they can both play chords. So like so, sometimes, sometimes, you know, like sometimes they'll clash with each other, uh, you know, if you're not careful, but, uh, but in, in my, you know, in, in, in the free jazz album, we actually used that to our advantage where we did things which were clashing. So we had all these like insane poly chords where like the guitar was playing one thing, the piano was playing a whole, whole other thing. And then I also like prepared the piano because I, I had Tibetan singing bowls on, on the strings of the piano. So at the same oh, cool. time, it was also like a, like a, like a percussion mm -hmm. instrument. So like I was clashing with the guitar and I was clashing with the drums and like there was this huge tension and it was so cool because like we never relieved the tension. We just had tension, 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 and then it, it didn't go anywhere. Like, you know, and people were like trying to like, people would be like, get off the tension, like relieve it, you know, or like change or something But we were just like on and on and on. And so it was really interesting because like it took a lot of energy to keep up that tension, but, but like, it was really, I think it was fun because, you know, yeah, because like, like, I think, I think like, like resolution is beautiful. Don't get me wrong. But at the same time, like, like having that tension and, and playing within that tension is like, is powerful, you know? Yes. That uncomfortable part. Yes. 
Well, right. and, I, and I feel like when, uh, like the, when I listen to your music, you know, like you do resolve things, but like, I also feel like you take us on journeys through tension, which I really like mm -hmm. about your playing. You know, it's not like, uh, uh, you know, like tension release, tension release. It's like, you, you'll, you'll build it up. You know, you'll, you'll like take us on a journey, which is nice. And like, oh. yeah, like, I think that's really cool. Yeah, that's, yeah. The journey part is like, definitely, that's, I'm glad that that translates. <clears throat> yeah, because I, yeah. Go ahead. I don't really know what I was going to say, so. <laughs> so it's, so uh, for, for you, it's very intentional, the, the idea of the journey or the idea of like, uh, of, you know, taking people on a little, you know, adventure, like that's, that's something that you're doing consciously. Yeah, and I'm taking myself to, <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and the process of like writing is also like a a journey and you're like, oh, how did I end up back at the same place? Let's go this way. Yeah. But I like the idea of like contrast, mm -hmm. which I don't know if that is what I'm actually doing, but I do one thing and then I want to, yeah, I want to give it some contrast a little bit. Yeah which I think a lot of people do in music with form and sections and stuff like that. How do you compose? I guess I... Or is it all improv? Oh, no, I do compose. Um, you know, I've, I've, um, um, I've, I've, I mean, I've written, I've written music for, I don't know, for ensembles, like, like, um, classical ensembles, string quartets, you know, all kinds of stuff, but, I would say yeah. like like even my compositions they all draw from improvisation. So like I'm always trying to blur the line between composition and improvisation where even when I write things down when I when I have a very definite score, you know, I I'm still trying to make it sound like it just happened in the moment. You know? Mm, yeah. Um so so yeah, um I, I I would say like my my compositional process it's kind of like a gardener, you know, where I plant all these seeds and then I kind of watch them grow and you know and and it's like yeah i i kind of let it happen you know um and then and then you know as a com like speaking about contrast then there's a whole nother side of myself which is kind of like a chess player slash architect where like where i've planned out the strategy and i know like like i've got the whole thing in my mind and then i'm just translating it out onto onto paper or onto my software as it so happens you know um so there's these two contrasts where you know it's kind of like I'm just letting it happen. And then there's the, you know, the, I, I've got a form in mind and I'm translating that form into, into a particular composition. Yeah. So I like the analogy of the gardener. Well, thank you. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> I actually, uh, the first, well, I, I heard Brian Eno talking about this, you know, about saying like, like, you know, that I, I'm, you know, that his style is, what he's doing is kind of like a gardener. Um, and I'm also really interested in generative music. So making rules or making algorithms, which then produce music. So like, so, you know, I've created like machines that basically create musical, you know, happenings, um, you know, that are right. like semi-random or completely random, you know, based on stochastic processes and sort of like, you know, particular, like, for example, I did a composition based on the Fibonacci sequence where like I, I mapped all the notes onto, you know, onto the spiral. And then also like I've done compositions where like it's based on a chess game that I played. So like I, I take each, you know, because as you know, like with, with chess, you can notate everything kind of like in algebraic notation. So I, I put a note to each move. And so I created this composition cool. based on a chess game. Yeah. So I, I would say like I draw I draw from these different areas of like, you know, either very concrete and very specific forms or or things that are very loose. And 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 like it depends totally on my mood, it depends on the inspiration, it depends on who I'm playing with or who I'm who who I'm writing for. Cause I think knowing who you're writing for and knowing what they can do really helps. Yeah, totally. <clears throat> So like the the ensemble that you put together for your recording, you know, um, with the horns. I think you had Paul uh, Tynan on trumpet and and yeah. Andrew Andrew on on trombone. I think. Um, yeah. So so when when you put together this ensemble, you must have had like a very good idea of like what kind of sound or what kind of aesthetic you were going for. Yeah, I like the sound of um, like 
brass and guitar mm-hmm. and the blend. Mm. Um, I like the sound of the saxophone, but I find it more just different. Right. Uh, yeah, and I just, I wanted my part to sort of be like another horn almost sometimes. So I don't play like a ton of chords in my mind, maybe someone would argue with that throughout that album. Yeah. Um, but I knew that like Paul and Andrew are up here in terms of ability. Um, so yeah, I didn't, I didn't like think like, could they play this? It was like, of course they could play this. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know if that answers your question, but. Sort of. Yeah. Sort of. It does. It does. It answers the question. And I and the reason that I also chose them was like they're amazing improvisers. Yes. So that was like part of it. <clears throat> and I wanted to create a a bed that they could just improvise really comfortably over. Yeah. Um, yeah. Definitely. Yeah. You know, um, I'm trying to remember what this place is. It's like an oyster bar, and like it's in a, in a historic building, um, and they have a piano in that. Oh, space. Chuck? Is it Chuck? Yeah, I think so. I think so. So you know, um, I I went there. I I went there. Um, you know, um, mm-hmm. I went there with a friend of mine, and uh, you know, and I I think I think it was um, I think it was Paul who was playing trumpet. Uh, and and like there was another guy playing keyboard and so you know I asked if I could go up and play and they said yes but they had no idea what they were getting themselves into because that that day I was in a very like experimental and like kind of jokester prankster kind of mood so like I I started playing this like ridiculous like dissonant free weird you know stuff on the on the on the keyboard and 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 like it was hilarious but like you know, Paul kept up with it. Like he was just like note for note. He's like matching everything that I was doing. It was so hilarious. And, and um, yeah, it was, it was, it was really fun. And, and so that's the first time that I met Paul and it was like really cool. Yeah. And I think you came to our gig at the Haligonian. Yeah. Or was I playing with someone else? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I remember actually, that's the first time that I met you. Um, I think. Yeah. Yeah. That was a while ago. Yeah, that was a while ago. Um, but yeah, that was that was really cool. I, I, I liked I yeah, I really liked what you guys did. It was it was really you know, it was it was really nice. Um I I guess I guess like that's the thing, right? Like when, when I connect with an artist or when I connect with, with a person, like it's it's you know, like it's like, you know, with intuition, you just know that you have a resonance with the person, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, like, you can kind of tell, okay, you know, I would like playing with this person, or, it, you know, it'll it'll be a, a fulfilling experience to play with this person. Yeah, there's, like, natural chemistry where you're not forcing it. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Which I find is hard to come by sometimes. It is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, what, sorry, what were we going to say? I was going to ask you, like, so you, you also, you know, you also are a singer songwriter. You also have been like experimenting with uh, songs. You know? Yeah. And, and that's really, I, I like that. Like, um, I think that's, that's really great that you're doing that kind of, that kind of stuff that I like that aesthetic for sure. You know? Um, and, and like, did you always sing? Like was singing always? No. Practice or? No. And I was like deathly afraid of singing. Like, <laughs> Like you know, Danuk, the Which composer. Yeah, yeah, I actually interviewed him for for uh, for the podcast. Yeah. Oh, okay, I'll have to check back on your other um, episodes. Um, he, I, I met him at Lamp, and uh, I was like, that you know, I could listen to him talk all day, and and asked him if I could like do a couple lessons with him. So I did a couple lessons with him. Nice. The first one, he was like, you have to sing. Um, like, can you sing this or whatever? And I was like, no, I can't. And he was like, can you sing the gesture? Like, you don't have to sing a note for note. And I was like, no, I, I can't do that. And he was like, come on, just like. 
and I was I like started crying um like it was like a phobia like un un in logical like fear of but it's that vulnerability thing yeah um not wanting to be vulnerable yes so then after that I was like screw this I'm going to sing like that is what a limitation to be that afraid uh so then I just started trying to sing and yeah it's a new thing I'm my voice is still very like weak because I never sang my whole life um so it's a new thing and it's just like yeah and it's a new exploration and I found once I started singing it really helped so many parts of music yeah 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 so it's a new thing and it's just completely by intuition like I'm when I'm writing a song, it's just whatever I find, then whatever I can find over top. I'm not like trying to do anything particular, if that yeah. makes sense. Yes, it does. Yeah. It does make sense. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, I'm so happy that, that you had that experience because <laughs> like, you know, like that's, that's so important to like, yeah, yeah and you conquered a phobia. So that's- Yeah, that's and so thank you, Danuk. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah well and uh you know i also met some very uh interesting artists at uh at lamp i met a guy called miles okasaki oh yeah and you know he's just remarkable like i i was lucky to get to jam with him you know i i had my uh my tumbak with me like the middle eastern drum and um yeah we we did a little jam and and you know in the middle of my playing, he's like, you're playing too complicated. You need to simplify this, you know? And and I was like, okay. So I simplified it and suddenly the, the grooves are, started to really like work and sing. And I was like, I was like, yeah, you know, like, the, like these are the kinds of experiences that like teach you, you know, it's kind of like, you know? And yeah. Yeah. Totally. And I, you know what? I've got a, I've got a melody that he played that day in that jam session stuck in my head. Like I haven't been able to get it out. It's just every time, like, I, I'm just thinking about, you know, just nothing. Like, I'm, you know, I'm just gazing out the window and the, the melody just comes back to me. And it was, it was such an angular and awkward melody. And I think that's why it's stuck in my head. But it was like, at the same time, it was totally singable. That's the thing. It was like, it was totally singable. Like, you can replicate it perfectly with your voice. And um, so, yeah, it's really interesting to consider, like, can I sing this? Can I repeat this, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Because it's, you're connecting your ear to your body. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. exactly. It's, yeah, that's, and, and I think that practice is so important. Like, like you mm -hmm. know, as a, as a tabla player, you know, um, I, from the time I was very young, you know, before, before I was ever allowed to play anything on the drum, I was, I had to be able to speak the rhythm. You know, I had to be able to actually say it before I could yeah. play it. And, and I mean, it's, it's a beautiful practice, but like, you know, now, now, like when I'm playing, you know, a massive, like, you know, polychord on a pipe organ, there's no way I could sing that, you know, um, you know, I don't even have the vocal range to cover it, but like, but like, I still think like, like if I was going to sing, like what, you know, how would it work? How would it fit? And so in some way, even though I'm not actually singing and singing is not like the first consideration, it still factors in, you know, it's still there. It's, it's still a consideration. Yeah. Yeah, and it's like, can you imagine it almost? Yeah. Yeah. And like, like your vocal range, would you consider yourself like an alto, a mezzo, a soprano? Where, where does your voice kind of fit in? I've never thought of that. <laughs> <laughs> um, just because it's not something that I'm taking, I don't want to say taking seriously, but that I'm it's not something I'm analyzing. Okay. I I want to say like alto to like higher part of alto maybe like or alto like you know like a little bit below middle C and then up. Nice. An an octave and a little bit. It's a small range right now. <laughs> yeah, because it's just not strong yet. 
yeah you'll you'll get it you i mean the more you yeah. practice you know the more yeah it'll it'll happen it'll happen yeah. and and you also i mean you studied at um at saint of x um mm -hmm. and, and did you did you study guitars jazz guitar yes yeah yeah i did um so, so like when when did your when did you start playing jazz guitar and when when did you know that that it was like that was the direction that you wanted to go in uh well in high school i played guitar and then i tried to play in the concert band and didn't like it so then i practiced so that i could play in the jazz band uh -huh. and then through that started like listening to more music um and then my teacher pulled me aside and she was like what are you gonna do after high school and i was like i don't know <laughs> um she was like oh you, you know you can like go study music and i was like what like it just never crossed my mind because my my parents um they're not in that world they're in a different world yeah and she, and she was like yeah you can you know you can go to school for music and so then i tried to pick up the classical and like uh -huh. get that under my fingers but was entering it really late like um and in high school i went to, like i had a job and stuff like i didn't have tons of time to play four hours a day or um to catch up to the rcm 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 yeah, yeah. yeah rcm level that I needed to be at and uh and found that naturally I liked listening to jazz like I enjoyed that yeah and didn't realize that you could go to school for that too and then she she was like well you you, you know you can go you know she just like opened my perception up and I was like oh okay maybe I'll try to go for that and when I auditioned, I was like, in my opinion, way below where I should have been. Um, because the whole first year was like this really stressful catch up of trying to catch up to where I needed to be. Mm -hmm. um, and through that developed an injury. Mm. So I had tendonitis and had to take um, the first semester of my second year off of playing and just do the all the other stuff mm -hmm. and in your second year you have a level so so that was just like maybe I should switch into something else but my teacher teachers were like encouraging and I was able to play again and then yeah finished my degree um yeah and I just I liked the kept jazz like keeps my attention i don't know if that makes sense yes absolutely and it's you can add that element of yourself um through improv once you learn how to play your instrument mm -hmm. um yeah so that's how that happened it was not a linear like no. this is what i'm doing it was like <laughs> yeah <sighs> Which is kind of how my whole life goes. It's just <laughs> like, yeah. Well, I'm so glad. I'm so glad that you stuck it out and that you continued, you know, playing because, yeah, I mean, you know, and and yeah, your professors. I'm glad they encouraged you because, like, having a, you know, having people there to like support you and encourage you. I mean, that's really important. It's it's like to have that community. Yeah, and my peers were like a big part of it too playing with them was inspiring and you felt connected yeah 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 definitely <clears throat> definitely um so like when, when you're you know when you're playing like uh you know do you do you ever like change the tuning like to something other than the standard like do you do you experiment at all with i don't know drop tuning or i don't know like like open <laughs> open tuning I don't know like would you do you work with any of that stuff um so it's not on like I I've just recently started doing a little bit of that like I will tune down one string mm -hmm. or just so that I'm not going where my muscle 
memory is like mm. it'll force me to be like oh i have to find something else yeah. um and oddly enough like a lesson a couple weeks ago she my student wanted to learn a neil young song and he dropped down the whole guitar so then i dropped down my whole guitar to like learn the song to teach it and and i was like oh this is kind of cool like maybe i'll write something in this so that's like slowly happening yeah 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 well you know um i I play a little bit of guitar as well and like um and i i really love experimenting with like microtones and like and tuning like one thing that i did was i tuned all the all the notes like all the all the strings to the same note so yeah so like that was a really interesting because there was so much sympathetic resonance you know yeah i played a piece at the 21st century guitar conference where the composer had that like so all the guitars were in different tunings and mine was in i can't remember what it was tuned to but it was all the same note <laughs> and then i had to like hit it with a slide nice it was really cool yeah. um yeah yeah, yeah. Well, and, and like, do you, do you ever like, I don't know, prepare the guitar or use like an Ebo or like any of these kinds of things? Again, um, <clears throat> excuse me, not, it's like this like new hmm. thing. So I'm, I'm like starting to do that a little bit, <clears throat> but it's not something I've done a lot of yet. And that, that was like, I started playing with that a little bit after the creative music workshop and then stopped. And then like, you know, there's these moments of like, Oh yeah, let's make it really different. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> and, uh, and how many guitars do you have? Um, <laughs> I have five guitars. <laughs> yes. But I like to justify that by saying I've been playing for 15 years. So that's like only one every three years. <laughs> well, hey, and I lend, I lend them out a lot. So I'm like, they're getting played, but I don't want to let them go. They're like my children. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I totally relate to that. Like, you, you, you know, your, your gear becomes like, it becomes part of the family almost. Yeah, and like each one feels different from me definitely yeah well hey thank you so much for for um for you know having this conversation with me i i really enjoyed it and uh yeah me too and i look forward look forward to you know um to hearing what you do next and also uh you know hopefully like having a chance to play with you to jam you know and to like collaborate because like i yeah. i really love what you're doing and uh and i'm excited to see like like what we can do together yeah, me too. Yeah, I look forward to collaborating. <laughs> See ya. Yeah.